Hello there 382 students. Uh, in this series of short videos I'm going to describe the basics of DNA supercoiling and then talk a little bit about topoisomerases which are the enzymes that regulate supercoiling in vivo. So you know that DNA exists as a double helix in which two nucleic acid strands are coiled around each other. On a larger scale the double helix can coil around itself to form supercoils. As an analogy, consider an old-fashioned telephone cord of the type you might see in 20th century movies or professor's offices. You know, you'll note that I had to go back to a textbook published in 1993 to get a good image for this analogy. The cord itself is coiled, but when the phone receiver is twisted in the right way, the coiled cord will form supercoils. DNA behaves in a similar way. So by the end of the supercoiling class, I'm hoping that you'll be able to do the following. First, determine the twist, writhe, whether interwound or spiral, linking number and superhelical density of example right-handed deoxyribonucleic acids. Now note that left-handed double helices are relatively rare in nature, and so we're going to focus only on supercoiling of right-handed double helices in this course. You should be able to compare the mechanisms of action of the different classes of topoisomerase, and you should be able to relate unwinding, underwinding, overwinding, and topoisomerase activity to changes in the twist, writhe, and linking number. All right, here we go. So to begin, let me define what is meant by the term twist, or T. The twist of a piece of DNA is the number of complete turns one strand makes around the axis of the double helix, which is also called the duplex axis. So, in this diagram, uh, which depicts the two strands of a double helix, if you start at the bottom and follow the darker blue strand toward the top of the diagram, you can count the number of complete revolutions it makes around the central helical axis. So that's one, two, three, four, five, and about a half. So by convention, right-handed twist is defined as positive whereas the left-handed twist is defined as negative. So because this is a right-handed double helix, the twist for this piece of DNA is plus 5.5. If you can't tell whether the helix is right-handed or left-handed, I encourage you to figure out how to do that, uh, because I will be expecting you to be able to do that. Tell if it's right-handed or left-handed just by looking at it. Okay, remember that one turn of a standard B DNA double helix contains about 10 base pairs. And this is the most energetically stable form for the DNA. So that means for a stretch of B DNA, the twist equals the number of base pairs divided by 10. This is a very useful thing to remember. So, for example, if we know that the twist of this section of BDNA is 5.5, we can infer that that piece of DNA contains 55 base pairs, 10 base pairs per turn. Now, let's think about how we might change the twist of this short piece of DNA. Now, suppose the bottom of the double helix, the double helix were fixed in place and unable to rotate then you can imagine rotating the top of the DNA in a clockwise direction, assuming you're looking down the axis from the top. Can you picture what would happen to the twist? Take a minute and think about it. We might want to pause the video before you go. What happens to the twist if you turn this clockwise? Well, if you rotate the top clockwise, you'd be unwinding the DNA. Rotating the top clockwise would result in each strand making fewer complete turns around the duplex axis and therefore the twist would decrease. The number of base pairs does not change so the number of base pairs per turn would increase above 10. You'd have more than 10 per turn. DNA in this state is called underwound. If you keep unwinding the DNA eventually you'll completely unwind it and you'll have two parallel strands. It's kind of like a ladder and the twist would be zero. Now, conversely, if you rotate the top of the double helix counterclockwise, each strand would make more complete turns around the duplex axis, and the twist would increase. For example, maybe to 6 or 7. The DNA would be called overwound. For BDNA, the most energetically favorable condition is to have 10 base pairs per turn. 
So therefore, if DNA is underwound or overwound, it is in an energetically unfavorable state, and there's tension in the double helix. And if we can anthropomorphize the DNA, we would say that the, DNA, the double helix wants to return to 10 base pairs per turn. That's its energetically favorable state. So in the next video, I'll explain how tension of this nature is resolved.